I didn't get a religious education at all. My parents had this idea that they didn't have anything against, but they wanted to let me and my sister reach this conclusion when we grow older. It was like up to us. But when I started thinking about making this film, I was 40-something, and I could see when I started thinking about what turned on to be Beyond the Hills, I could see the difference between my ideas when I was 25 and my ideas when I was 40. It was a very small process in which I gave up uh, very quick judgments of people, of things that I didn't know well. I started, I don't know, taking some time and actually asking myself, so what, what is a little bit more deep inside this thing before just judging it? And there was this piece of news coming out in 2005, probably, I think, that a girl died in suspicious conditions at a monastery. And I could see the spectacular potential of the story, but I was afraid it's just a very spectacular story, that kind of piece of news that people want to read about. But what was it about? And I decided that I won't be making a film out of it unless I understand what, what is it about? What, what, what aspect of our everyday life this story illuminates? And I started thinking that I could make a film about something that concerned me. This difference between being religious being superstitious and being a churchgoer because they are not the same thing and people don't really make this difference well enough. And at some point, thinking a lot about it, I saw a possibility of speaking about two things, about love and of different exceptions of what love is and speaking about how relative it can be to distinguish good from evil in our everyday world. Because actually good and evil are appreciated accordingly to your values about the world, about what comes out in front of you. And I have to say that I never plan to come up with a conclusion in my films. The film should always stay a kind of an investigation and it took a very long while, and I was trying to document the things before I learned that I have to, I have to give, give up the original characters. I'm not talking about them. At some point, somebody gave to me some footage. They were shooting at the trial, and so I could see some footage with these two girls from the original incident. I learned immediately that I'm not talking about that girl who died because she looked sick to me. And this is not interesting for me to make a story about a special case and to talk about somebody who's sick. I'm interested to talk about somebody who's perfectly sane, who has a point of view, like a, a rational, valid point of view about something important. And he clashes or she clashes in this point of view with somebody else. <laughs> And actually, I thought a lot about her, about what kind of character she is, about why people were judging her then. And I decided that it was all this because she was free and different, and she could express her feelings better than the others, and she was not superstitious. And actually, she was the force of this story. I thought that she was innocent, in a way. And there is a relationship in my mind between religion and innocence. And I think that you can be a more religious person, even if you don't ever go to church, if you are very clean and innocent and, and listen to the world and do the good things that normally, I don't know, the Christian religion teaches you to do, then if you compare this to somebody respecting strictly all the habits that the church tells you that you need to respect.
I started building from there. I started building from this character. I started building this relationship. I knew that I wanted to tell the story from a subjective point of view. So I was having three main characters, the two girls and the priest. And for a while I was considering which is the right perspective. Of course, it's difficult to tell it from the perspective of somebody who dies, but it's not impossible. It's not about this that I chose Wojtyla. I chose Wojtyla to be the main character because for me the main character is he who understands something. He who takes the effects of what happened in the story on him more than the others. I don't like this this films in which, I don't know, in a matter of days people are different at the end, completely different and wise and they learned everything they had changed. I think this is, you know, the cliche of simplifying uh, things from mainstream cinema but i think that you could you could choose a character in a moment in which somebody start having doubts and doubts are all i needed some doubts about the things that were were told to you of course in order to have doubts you need to still be free and open in your mind you need to be free to question things Why are you doing the things that you do? Maybe there is a reason, but have you asked yourself why? Very often people just get into this routine and they don't ask. They consider that it's not good to ask, it's good to do. And I thought that as Voikita was evolving, she might start having some doubts about the routine, about the attitude for her friend, about the nature of the love that this friend has for her, of the nature of love that she has for her friend and of the attitude of all this group of people and most importantly about the nature of the evil what was the nature of this evil where is this evil coming from do we know for sure can we be sure that we can cure this and i thought that by the end of the film she can have enough doubts so that at the end she might at least consider that maybe this wasn't the only way maybe she wasn't right I learned a lot about the past of this priest through Corneliu Porumboiu the Romanian film director and a good friend of mine they were colleagues in school so I had access to a lot of personal stories about this priest the real one and this helped me a lot also in understanding what kind of a character my priest was and it it was very clear for me that he was somebody very well intended with his set of values and of course for any priest the most important thing is to make sure that there's uh, love inside you there's good inside you and there's no evil inside you but they might be interpreting evil sometimes in a in an extreme way da ce zis care nu se scrimește smântali să mă nu se vorbesc cu ea but that evil might have been wrongly identified so i thought the potential in the story of speaking about guilt in society nowadays and speaking about responsibility and empathy for the other because actually the people from the church were together with this girl trying to help her all the time and their first reflex was very good in reality they took her immediately to a hospital but you know later on if somebody from the hospital tells you just take it back and pray for her that well you know it starts being a bit more difficult to see who is really guilty it's about a society it's about a society who was poor for a long time as you know poverty is always associated with with superstitions because people will just explain things out of their you know lack of knowledge because it's not rational it's like in primitive societies in a way <laughs> And there was a conversation that I was having with my actresses a lot of times about the end of the film and about this priest 
and about the fact that if you read some religious books and you place yourself in his shoes, you might learn that from his point of view, he succeeded in what his mission was. He succeeded to take out the evil from this girl while she was still alive. Eventually, after this, she, she died, but he was not connecting these two incidents. His mission was to make sure that his, her soul was pure, innocent, and the badness, to say like this, from her uh, was deleted. Of course, the situation shows to you how difficult things can be to be judged. So the screenplay grew, and it grew up to the point where I needed 240 pages to cover the story, which is like four hours. And at the same time, there was um, a pressure on top of me that I felt uh, it was accumulating. Um, if I was to shoot that screenplay, I needed to to find the right actors. And at some point, while writing one of the original versions of the screenplay, I realized that there's a connotation which was very important for me in the screenplay, which was the regional accent. The story happened, and not by accident, in our part of Moldova in Romania. And everybody in this country associates Moldovans with stupid people somehow, and simply because of the accent. Mama Elena Matal, I don't know what I'm doing. And I thought that since the original story was placed there and since this plays an important role in judging these people out, I wanted to keep this, even if this is just for people understanding Romanian. So I started with the idea that I want to make a cast only with actors that could speak this, could have this accent naturally. You can't fake it. I've seen this in a lot of Romanian films, it's fake. So all of a sudden, my, my choice of actors shrinked to that region. I started casting and I couldn't find the girls at the theater in my hometown where people have this accent. So I started looking randomly, but somehow in a very strange way, whenever I was picking a picture uh, from the database of actors from my casting director, he was somehow surprised because I was picking up Moldovans or picking people from my hometown originally. I don't know how, it's, it's a matter of looks. So this is how I came with Christina Flutur. I asked Christina Flutur to come and to have an audition. And when she came, I learned that she could do the accent, and she's originally from my hometown, and she lives a couple of streets away. She had this kind of an innocence, she had this kind of cleanness of soul that I wanted. She could relate to the poverty and the situation. And I knew once I found Christina that the most difficult part of the casting was there. So I started uh, preparing the film and I learned very soon something, that there was a flaw in all, the whole plan. The church wouldn't allow me to shoot in one of their locations. And I learned this very, very soon. And then I realized that I don't even want to shoot necessarily in their locations because I was imagining that there might be religious people in the crew and I, I you know, you couldn't really work there if you had to stop uh, for the mess, for example, and wait for the mess. So I said, look, uh, we will do something else. We will look for the right location and we will build it. For once, we need to have the budget to build this. So instead of scouting for a church, we started scouting for a hill. A hill that would be nearby a church, nearby a small community. And I needed a location that could generate this kind of shot where I could link directly the view on a small town from a distance, from their distance. But when you turn the camera, they would be completely apart from all this. 
So eventually, after a lot of scouting, I came up with a hill like 100 kilometers away from Bukovest. So we decided to build there. But of course, we had to bring everything. There was no light. So we had to bring light on the hill. We had to bring some water on the hill. We had to bring some, you know, to camp somewhere. So it, it was clear that this is going to be a, a, a difficult process. But I was hoping that because I was rehearsing with the actors in the set, even when the set was still being built, they would treat it as a set. But I was wrong. I was completely wrong. The moment the church was ready and some of the actors got inside, they just did the cross sign and they considered that that was a sacred place which created a different sets of problems because I was, I was never imagining how difficult uh, it was going to be to work with so many religious people for such a set. I could see this coming a little bit during the casting because at some point I couldn't really find the right mother superior and finally, my casting agent came up with this lady who wasn't really acting. She used to be an actress, and he told me, see her, but take care, she is very religious. She looks the way she is because, you know. She came and I talked to her and we read a little bit and I told her, look, I think that we might work together. I think that you are quite, quite close to what I need. I know that you haven't acted, and you haven't acted in a film. Would you try to do this and like for these long portions, would you have any kind of problems? And she said, well, I will have to check about this, and I'll get back with an answer. And actually, she checked with her confessor, and he told her, actually, yes, because this is what you prepared for, and it's nothing wrong as long as you defend our cause. So she came to me, she told me this, and I said, okay, but then I need to know what would this cause be, just to make sure that we work for the same film. And she said, well, it's the truth. I said, well, good, then we work for the same film. It's the truth for me as well. And so we started working together. But it wasn't simple. It wasn't simple because at some point, they needed, the actors needed, the crew needed, to know how things goes, go in reality. So I brought some priests who could tell us what are precisely the habits, from the way you arrange things to the way in which the sermon takes place. The first day of shooting when Valerio had to shoot, he got dressed into this priest costume. And the real priest came to him and asked him, do you have permission to wear this? Like, what kind of permission? And that guy told him, look, this is not a costume. You have to understand, it's not just some costume. This was sacred by somebody at some point, and it comes with, with you need a permission from a priest. And the shooting day was ruined, and I decided after a couple of days, because every two persons speaking about the habits in the church were having different opinion because habits are different. And at some point I said, look, it's not about this actually, and I will decide. I understand. I understand what I needed to understand. Thank you. You may go home. I understand. I understand about the sermon. You may go home. And from this moment on, it's me who decides about this. And you don't like this costume very well. We will just not rent one. We will just do another one for you. But from this moment on, we need to figure out that this is a film, yes? And this is wood. This is not a church. It's just wood. We built it one month ago. It's not sacred. There's nothing holy in here. Let's focus to our film. And, you know, from that moment onwards, it went a bit better, even if, even if you know, for all the religious actresses in the crew and for all the religious people, this stayed up to the end. A certain way of just, you know, keeping things quiet because you never know. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I was doing a film in which nature was playing an important part. I couldn't control everything as normally directors do because I knew that I was shooting winter time in Romania 
and I knew that snow might come one day. So we were just prepared for this. That was a winter in which snow was coming very, very late. It didn't snow in the first part of January, but when it came, it was a snowstorm. So I had to make a decision then, because from that moment on, the, the film would look different. And I decided that um, despite everybody else's advice, I will try to come out in that snow and shoot that moment. Of course, people would tell me that it's impossible because the wind was changing and all the time there were flakes coming towards the camera. But somehow I figured out that if you were smart enough and you knew how to hide the camera and to position it respecting the wind, you could do it. It was difficult, but nevertheless, it was so spectacular that I needed to have that moment and I learned that that moment was coming in the right moment for me in the film. There were several moments in which this could have come. Because I wanted to associate this storm with something corresponding with Wojtyla's inner storm, if you want. And that's an important moment. So I got the crew outside and we shot that moment. And from that moment on, it seemed that all the other scenes were somehow connected with snow. And by the end of the film, we were also trying to match whatever nature was offering us with whatever was happening to the character in the film. We couldn't shoot digital. We made some tests, and it was so cold outside that you needed to shoot on a mechanical camera. Part of the film was shot at some minus 15 degrees Celsius, and even when you had minus 10, well, it's not nice. It's difficult to focus. It's difficult to focus on what you have to do. And it wasn't difficult for me somehow, because, you know, this is why directors make films. You live out of the adrenaline that the film will provide for you for that period. But I think that apart from you, it's the cinematographer and the actors, and if you're lucky, maybe the sound people and the gaffer. For the rest, it's very cold because they have a lot of pauses. So it was a very, very difficult period of shooting. I decided working with the sound people that I need to make sure that Whatever they say while whispering, I will have to understand. So we planted a lot of tiny microphones everywhere on top of the microphones that the girls were having on them, just to make sure that we record everything in real time. On top of this, we were trying to record a lot of natural sounds from the situation. But even with all this preparation, I think we ended up by having more than five different sounds added during the clinics. We needed to add all this because it's so silent in the mountains. And at the same time, what happens inside these characters is not silent. They have a lot of emotions. So how will you match what they feel with what you see in the shot in terms of rhythm and with what's inside. And this is where we always end up by working a lot with just the, the slate of sounds that the situation would offer to us. But you know, there are some other things which are great. There is a scene in the film where finally Wojtyla decides that what's happening is not good and she will set free her friend. Alina is chained and it's cold outside, so she wakes up in the night, she goes there, she unchains Alina, and she leaves, hoping that this is enough for Alina to just understand that she might fight for her life and go. And then she goes to her cell and she sits like this on the bed, listening to make sure that what she wants is really happening. And you hear this. You hear some chains, you hope that it's her chains, and then you hear the, some steps.
and the steps come close to the door and they stop for a while, but they continue. And then you hear the gate. The gate of this monastery opening and closing. And then, you know, she's relieved that she managed to do this and she gets to sleep. Come. And of course, in the morning, you see that Alina, is, she's still there, and it's very easy to imagine that there was somebody else. And it's the power of hoping that things are happening the way you want. But in the film, this was only expressed through sound and through the acting, through the acting of, of Cosmina Stratanas Vojkica. Because, you know, what I ask my, my actors to do is to create this music that I'm not hearing. They might create it from inside. You must feel, you must be there with them. And the only thing I need to do is to, to make sure that they are, they are not faking too much the situation. They really have this capacity of being empathical to the character. And then I need to find the right position of the camera to capture this. And as much as, you know, filmmaking is relative and sometimes you know that you don't know if it's good or not, sometimes you see that it's good. When, when you see this thing happening, when you see this emotion, when you s work with some actors who are so generous and skilled enough to place themselves in, the, in this position of their virtual c characters, it's very difficult to tell the difference between fiction and reality, and you capture this. And that's a moment satisfying in itself. Let's stay a little bit more. Maybe you can tell me something about the story. Have you ever seen it? Oh, Alina. I mean, if you see it, you'll be able to see it. And there were a few moments on the set when people kind of like lost their temper because they were fighting so much for their own point of view in this religious story that, you know, it, it became physical in a way. And I had to calm them down because you could feel the adrenaline pumping into them all of a sudden because it wasn't about their characters, it was about you and me and about being right. And because some of the scenes were, were very physical, th this was a, would affect you as an actor. It's not that simple. It's not that you can draw this line and say, I'm just an actor. Well, it's, it's not like this. And I think that we all knew what we were talking about and we learned the night when we shot the first outburst, this evil outburst that uh, Alina is having. <laughs> After a few takes, I needed to calm them down because all of a sudden they started, I don't know, having access to this kind of energy that they imagined the real characters were having access to. And there you could see the struggle which was there on the set. And every film is influenced by all the things which happened to happen to the people working for it in that period. I allowed once Valerio to go home from where we were because he was having, you know, several days off. And he came back a different character. We couldn't shoot, he was somebody else. So I decided that everybody will just stay there because we were so far away and little by little, we were so secluded in our minds and in this story, so far away from civilization and this small community created by the people in the small town that worked for the film that I needed to keep it this way. At some point, the film really became very dynamic in terms of sound, but in terms of camera movement as well. And, you know, whenever you're having action scenes in a film, it's not so difficult to set them up if you shoot piece by piece and you put them together while you edit. But for us, it's difficult because it's like in theater. It's just one long shot. Everything happens in front of you. It needs to be real. And, you know, shooting action in just one shot, that's something, and it's complicated. Everything needs to be precise. There is a shot in the film, Alina has started the fire and the curtain is on fire and the camera gets out and follows Vojkica closely and uh, she takes a bucket of water and she tries to put the fire off and then she takes uh, 
some wood uh, and with that wood she takes the curtain off and all this shot ends with her matching uh, the eyes of, of Alina inside who looks for help because all of a sudden everybody is fighting her. Shooting that thing is very complicated and it gives the actors, I don't know, the energy which is very close to the real thing. Because, you know, um, you don't fake things. You might get hurt and it's not about getting hurt physically, but you will definitely be hurt emotionally. And I have to say that the most difficult thing in this film was for Christina Fluto to just get herself in, in the position of Alina. Because there are different kind of actors. Some actors are more professionals. They do it very well, but they don't take it personally. Some other actors need to experience as much as possible the experiences of the person they play. <laughs> she was that kind of an actress. And she had some, you know, a lot of miserable days during the shooting because she felt very close to that character and she was trying to keep her character outside her working hours. And I think that the film turned out to be so good and they were so good as actresses because they felt a lot of empathy for the situation, for the relationship between these two girls. We had the premiere, and at the premiere, we asked a lot of people to just come watch the film, including a lot of religious people and a lot of priests. A few months later, some articles about this starting being generated from the, from the parts of the clerics, saying that actually, you know, um, the film is not against Christianity. And actually, the film does something good, in the sense that it's not judgmental, and this is good enough. And little by little, um, I started getting this information that the film was more and more viewed, regarded, watched in the monasteries. And somehow, one year later, they started having the feeling that maybe this was one of the good films about the essence of Christianity and about the Orthodox religion which was being made. And because the film is so not judgmental, maybe it's good for younger people stepping inside that film to think about what this film shows to them. And to be honest, I was pleased by this reaction. I was pleased that they had the patience to watch the film, first of all, and that some of them had the openness to think about what the film was trying to tell them because the film is just encouraging you to analyze, to have your own opinion, not to just sit behind your chair pretending that you know something before you think about it in detail because we speak about, about important things. Are you sure you make the difference between having faith, being religious, or being superstitious, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you spend enough time in your life to do this. Try to figure out what is the difference. Try to figure out what are the real causes of your behavior in, in your real life. And try to figure out if, you know, being a Christian is more about helping the others and being empathic to the others or going to church every Sunday. What is your attitude towards somebody who needs help? That maybe defines what being a Christian is. So I thought that, you know, the film speaks about a lot of important things that no matter uh, what your religion is, is, is good to think about it. It speaks about what happened whenever you're not questioning a set of rules that was given to you, even if it doesn't have much to do with religion. But you know, the, the most atrocious things during the history was made in the name of love for uh, your God and coming out of religion, just as a proof of faith for, you know, the thing that you accepted. Maybe it's good to think about, about this a little bit. And I was happy that little by little, I think that I generated this feeling quite on a larger scale.
And one of the best comments that I collected was coming from both sides, here or there, that, well, you know, maybe I won't be that judgmental now that I've seen the other's point of view. And this was coming to me from religious people as well, but from, uh, you know, people who hated completely this idea that maybe there is something in religion. So I thought that, in a way, from this perspective, uh, one of the things that the film was trying to do succeeded.